Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Holy Father, on this second Sunday after Pentecost, would you call us to see ourselves as your precious family in this world who bind one another together and help each other bear each other's burdens and live in this world as those who proclaim your goodness. And in all the struggles and the challenges of family, would you keep our eyes fixed on you and on the grace that you pour out upon your creation For, Father, we look to you as our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, now that the hubbub of the installation and the new organ has passed us by, it has been a much quieter week in the Rowell household, as you might imagine. We spent this last week getting ready for the arrival of our new baby. And thanks to God's grace and your sweet generosity, we are about as ready as we can be. The car seat is strapped in the back seat. The very masculine diaper bag has been packed. And there is a stroller and a jogging stroller. I didn't know I had to have two strollers. Have both been assembled and tuned up and are sitting near the door in the go position. I even have a little video camera that's focused on an empty crib that's just waiting for a little Hazel or little Eben to fill the frame. Every one of you has gleefully told us that our lives are about to change in the most radical of ways. And the easy part is indeed just about over, isn't it? Now comes the pain and the screaming and the why did you do this to me's that I'm sure are going to be coming in the next few days, and by God's grace, the little boy or the little girl of our dreams, who will be perfect in every way and never disobey us and become that retirement plan that we've been looking for, right? (laughs) Given that Mimi is just 10 or so days away from beginning her labor, labor, you can imagine that what we heard from Genesis 3 struck me really powerfully this week. The pangs of childbirth that Eve experienced seem like an appropriate thing for me to be thinking about and meditating on, terrifying as it is. The lectionary gave me lots of passages about the complexity of family and the struggles that we find in our families from life's first cry to final breath because of sin. The woman's greatly increased pangs in childbirth were certainly at the center of my prayers and my thoughts, but I couldn't help but hear in Paul's letter to the Corinthians and that reading that I just read from Mark's gospel that family all throughout time since the birth of sin has been full of struggle and agony. There's a brokenness and a groaning in creation because of human pride and willfulness that we all have to deal with. But I hope that you also heard, as we read all of those passages, this hope in every one of them. There's this sense of family woe certainly happening, but there's this counter-narrative all through those readings that declares the grace of God. If you're here this morning and you are a human being, there is complexity and conflict in your family somewhere. And God promises us today, at every turn, that he is with us in it all. So let me begin this morning with that reading from Genesis 3. You you knew as soon as Katie Hubbard started to read it that you'd been dropped into the middle of the original disaster story, right? Where humanity had poisoned our relationship with God through this sin of this perceived self-sufficiency, that we could make our own decisions in the world. When God comes into the garden, he wants to walk with his precious friends in the cool of the evening, but he doesn't find them where he usually finds them. Instead, they're cowering with fear and shame. They know that they breached their relationship with God, and they've suddenly realized that they are naked, and they are vulnerable. So Jesus begins an inquest, right? What exactly has happened? He asks the man and the woman, and all of a sudden all we get is this 
this slate of blame and family division and anger arise between the man and the woman. The woman that you gave me, God, she made me do it. It's either her fault or it's your fault, right? That's what we hear from the man. And the woman says, well, you're the one that made the serpent so crafty. It's either his fault or it's your fault, God. It certainly couldn't be me that has done this. But regardless of how the blame is distributed, the consequences of the sin fall squarely upon them both. God has been mistrusted. The word of God has been ignored. And this breach in relationship with God has yielded for them a distorted relationship with all of creation and a distorted relationship with one another. For the woman, birthing the human race will now become a painful and life-threatening experience, one which men we simply cannot fathom, can we? I took a childbirth class yesterday. It does not look like fun at all. And her relationship with the man, which had previously been characterized by mutuality and partnership, was now going to be marked by control. Scripture says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Isn't it interesting that patriarchy was not a part of God's original plan for creation? It only comes into the world after the fall. For the man, we learn that feeding himself and feeding his family will now become a terrible struggle. The garden gave up its fruit with ease, but now the ground has been cursed. And the creation that man was supposed to tend has now set itself against him. Because of human pride and disobedience, every aspect of creation has been corrupted. Marriage, sexuality, work, agriculture, industry, all now exist in the shadow of the fall. And it would be easy to end that reading and just realize that we are truly doomed. But lest we wallow too much in the sorrow of this story, I don't want us to miss God's grace in all of this. The miracle, friends, is that creation continues at all, right? I mean, the facts of the case warranted destruction. And yet, God insists on life. God chooses by his unmerited love to stay in relationship with us. And it's a relationship that isn't a far off, it isn't a distant relationship. He meets Adam and Eve exactly where they are. We were suffering with shame. We were about to be kicked out of the garden to fend for ourselves. We were naked and vulnerable. And what does God's word tell us? And that God was there at the gates of Eden for the man and the woman with garments of skin to cover them and to protect them. It's a hint already in these early verses of Genesis of God's eventual plan to clothe each one of us in righteousness with garments of salvation. God stays in relationship with us. And that means that the man and the woman have the power to stay in relationship with one another. I don't know if you heard what happened at the very end of that reading from Genesis 3 today, but you may remember that earlier in the story, the man had been given the power to name all of creation, right? In Jewish thought, this is a powerful thing. To name something was to bless it. And that's what God had charged Adam to do. And he does that. For his wife. I mean, this woman who he had just accused of destroying the whole of creation, he takes her into his arms and he names her. He blesses her. He names her Eve, which means life giver, because scripture tells us she is the mother of us all. I don't want you to miss this. The sentence was death, and yet God, in his grace, allows for life to go on. He himself gives us the hope that our families might live even in the face of sin. He clothes us with righteousness and lets us hang together through it all. 
the brokenness of our families is healed only through the goodness of our God. Let's turn now to that reading from the Gospel of Mark. In Mark 3, we see on the one hand, human division still plaguing the human race. And on the other hand, God still providing for healing. We learn today that Jesus, who was God in the flesh, even he had conflict within his earthly family, right? His family think that he's lost his mind. And they're outside of this house where he's eating with his disciples, trying to get him to come out and stop the rabble-rousing that he's doing, right? They're trying to restrain him from continuing his ministry. And the way that Mark frames the story, he wants us to lump his family members in with those scribes that came down from Jerusalem who had been claiming that Jesus was casting out demons under the power of darkness, which means that they too are dangerously close to committing the unforgivable sin. Now, what is the unforgivable sin that Mark talks about today? Well, it is to see the work of God and to deny its power. It's to say no to God's great yes of grace. And that's our choice. Our wills are free to say yes to God's goodness in our lives or to say no thanks. And Jesus' earthly family, just like the religious leaders, should have seen that his work was the power of God in the world. But just like the man and the woman in the garden, they would not allow the power of God to have power in their lives. Now we know that this was repaired and amended. We know that his mother was at the cross embracing him as he came down from the cross. We know that his brothers became prophets in the church, proclaimers of the gospel. But at this moment, they are outside the family of God, dangerously close to saying no to the good work of God. It's a terrible story, isn't it? It's a woe-filled story. But lest we wallow too much in the sorrow of that story, I don't want us to miss glimpses of God's grace. The miracle in this story is that forgiveness abounds. You know, when I was reading the gospel out there in the midst of the nave, as soon as you start talking about the unpardonable sin, our ears perk up, don't they? We really want to know what on earth is the unforgivable sin. And we ask that question really quickly, don't we? But we we like to focus on the negatives in stories so often. But we miss the mercy of what Jesus actually said first. Listen to what Jesus said. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. Period. Praise God for his grace, right? That he wants to reach out and let his power and his grace wash over our lives and the lives of our families and to redeem us. And if you're a sinner and if you're here today and you're breathing, that's you and that's me. We're sinners desperately in needs of God's grace. And if we know that, we know that we cannot depend upon ourselves to save ourselves. Then We do not need to be worrying about the unforgivable sin. God promises that those of us who throw ourselves at the foot of his cross and beg for his mercy, nothing can separate us from the love of God that we see in Christ Jesus. There's another moment of grace in this story that I don't want you to miss. We also hear in this this story of Jesus and his family, this idea of a new family that God creates for us when our earthly families fall apart. My friends, the church is the continuing sign of God's love for creation, and this is a place of healing. When he's told that his family is outside rejecting the power of God that was revealing itself in his life, Jesus looks around the room and he goes, who exactly is my mother? Who exactly is my brother? And after what you might imagine is a pregnant pause, he says, those of us who are doing the will of God, we are family. You're my mother. You're my brother. 
You're my sister. Which is not to say that Jesus doesn't love that earthly family that gathers outside. First Timothy tells us that God desires the salvation. He wills the salvation of all humanity. But what it does remind us of is that God has given us each other as a family. So that when the brokenness of our earthly families becomes too much for each one of us as individuals to bear, we can look around that nave and around these transepts and around this chancel and we can see that we are for one another brothers and sisters, elders and children all bound together and bearing one another's burdens. God's church is his body on earth, and we become a sign of God's grace. And when people come to visit us, I want us to find that they live in this broken world outside, and they come into a community of truly broken people, but people who are being bound up and restored and strengthened with one another. The broken hearts that live within these walls are being mended. And the brokenness of our hearts is healed only to the goodness of our God. Finally, I want to close with something from that letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If you ever read through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, they can be terribly depressing letters, right? I mean, Paul has a struggling relationship with the people of Corinth. There were divisions in that church that were tearing them apart. I mean, even within God's family, where everything is blissful and perfect, right? It's not. It's not. We're real people full of sin and strife, right? Sin eats at the heart of humanity. It breaches the bonds of affection, even in the church. And Paul is writing to a church that had grieved his heart. It was a church with whom he had a terribly painful relationship, and 2 Corinthians can be a very depressing read. But lest we wallow too much in the sorrow of that broken relationship, I don't want us to miss the glimpses of God's grace that Paul is laying before this church with whom he had such struggles. Because the miracle in that story is that salvation is still promised both to Paul and to the letter to whom that church to whom he was writing. God will not relent in his passion to redeem you, to redeem me. When Paul's writing in the midst of this anger and disappointment and division, but what he wants them to remember is that this earthly life that we live in is fading away and being replaced with this hopeful moment where all of our family divisions will be washed away in the blood of Christ Jesus. No matter what we wrestle with in this earthly life, Paul tells us God raised Jesus from the dead. And that is this ultimate reality that we hope for. And because he raised Jesus from the dead, that means that he will raise you too. He will raise me too. If we're bound up in Christ Jesus, we're, we're raised. But the key word in that is he says, we're raised together. And Paul is saying, we will be bound up together. We're a broken family. There's a twistedness in our relationship, but God will have the last word. His ultimate yes of grace to us is something that we hear together. In many ways, what we read in 2 Corinthians today is the end of the story that began way back in Genesis. Paul is rejoicing that the family of God, as divided as we can often be, will one day stand together again in the garden of God, redeemed, renewed, restored, transformed. So Paul says, don't lose heart, right? Be joyful, be thankful. Our outer nature is wasting away. There's corruption and sin that continue to haunt us. But because of who Jesus is, our inner natures are being restored and renewed day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment because of the grace of God. And one of the most beautiful things in all of Scripture are hidden 
in this story. Paul says the slight momentary afflictions of, of this life are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. An eternal weight, just this substantial nature of the grace of God that's been promised to us. The brokenness of our souls can only be healed to the goodness of our God. Now, I haven't known y'all for very long, so I don't know all the particulars of the struggles and the pains and the turmoils that affect each one of your families. But my family, Mimi's family, our families aren't any different than your families. We've got dark patches and pains and our prodigals. But we know that God is good. And if we wait for him, like a watchman waits for the morning, he promises to provide for our families like he provided for the man and the woman in the garden. He promises to bring us together as a new family in him, the church. It gives us resources and strength to bear each other's burdens. And he also promises that despite all of our divisions and all of our sins, the day is coming where an eternal weight of glory is given to his church and we will stand in his presence in the garden and we will know delight again. God is indeed good. Amen.